You're listening to Sasquatch Syndicate. What are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? Or I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. And all the ape believers don't want any of the paranormal believers to say anything because they're all whacked and screwed up and we don't want them. And all the paranormal believers don't want to go to the ape believers saying, well, you're all closed minded. You're not open to the fact that that it does this and it does that. And I look over my left shoulder and this creature is running through the woods and it's bulldozing a brush down. And I knew, man, this thing is going to get me. Welcome to Sasquatch Syndicate. I'm your host, Chuck, out in Seattle, Washington, along with Paul in Portland, Oregon. Thanks to everyone for listening and those following us at SasquatchSyndicate.com and on our social media outlets. Season's greetings, everyone, and to all those listening, we hope you're having a magical holiday season. Before we get into this year's holiday special, Paul and I wanted to first thank and dedicate this podcast to all the men and women serving in the U.S. and Canadian militaries, especially those not able to be with their loved ones this season. And finally, to all those listening, Paul and I both know firsthand what it's like to be alone over the holidays. We know what it's like to suffer from loss, the anguish of the mind, the emptiness of the heart, and the restlessness of the soul. We want you to know that you have us and we have you. So while Paul and I can't fix all the ills of the world this holiday, we will attempt to make it a whole lot better. So sit back, relax, as Sasquatch Syndicate proudly presents Les Stroud, a.k.a. Survivor Man. listening uh, listen this is a, a sincere shout out to the troops uh from survivor man les stroud i hope that your holidays are good i hope that you're able to to be in touch with your loved ones and uh, really appreciate everything that you're doing thank you very much thanks to you also les not only for coming on sasquatch syndicate this holiday but for those that have never met les he's absolutely one of the hardest working men in the business And when he's not out producing documentary films like Survivor Man and Shark Week, Les spends a lot of his time with the troops doing survival training. Les, could you share a little bit about that experience? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a request to to do the to to get back out with them uh, yet again. Um, I've spent time working with um, actually they call it the JTF Task Force, uh, JTF Two, I believe it's called. It's it's sort of like a a Canadian version, a a Green Beret kind of. Thing. And these guys, they're, they're young. They're, they're, they're 18, 19, 20. Um, and uh, I went out with them to do uh, advanced survival training. What I found was that um, there is a lot of great survival training that goes on uh, within the forces. Uh, uh, but I guess my version of survival is that, you know, if, if, you know, if you've got nothing, what do you do then? And so that was really good because I was able to bring to them um, uh, a direction of survival training that was different from what they had. It's basically all right. What do you do if you don't have your kit? And uh, and I work with them on the, on winter survival. And and actually, there's a request for me to go back this winter and uh, uh, with a different troop uh, and do that again. So Les, there's a lot of folks out there alone this holiday. They're surviving, but they're just getting through it. And certainly, none of us on this show are strangers to having been alone or dealing with loss. But can you share a few encouraging words on? How Survivor Man deals with being alone and dealing with loss in a survival situation. I think the, the concept, the psychology behind being alone in a survival situation is almost a very, uh, I don't know what to say, underrated, but certainly underestimated 
um, aspect of survival. It, it can possibly be the, the most difficult part. So many other things to do with surviving have to do with the technicality, the equipment you use, the food you must get, the water you must drink, those sorts of things. Do you need to stay cold? Do you need, do you need to uh, sorry? Do you need to cool down from the heat? Do you need to, to warm up from the cold? So th that's a lot of very obvious survival aspects of survival that we always dwell upon. But in reality, it can be the aloneness that can be much more crushing than anything else because it's crushing to the spirit. And for me, um, you know. Honestly, a lot of times by the third or fourth day of Survivor Man, I quit, uh, and I, I quit emotionally and I quit mentally. And, and, and of course, uh, I don't physically actually quit, but I quit inside because I feel like, why am I out here? Why am I? I'm completely. I have my buddies are out drinking beer somewhere. People are having dinner, and I and it gets very, very tough, very depressing to be alone, especially if you already are a gregarious person or you're into other people and that. It's, it can be very tough. The thing that gets me through it is reminding myself that I'm involved in something that's bigger than me, that I'm involved in, in actions, and in my case, it happens to be, you know, instruction because I'm, I'm teaching how to survive in, in a situation. Um, and so I remind myself of that. I think about um, the young boys and girls who, love, who, who, who religiously watch Survivor Man you know, uh, because they just they just really enjoy it so much and, and make them get outside. I think about them, and I think about people who are hanging off, uh, you know, every word of, of some instruction on a fireball. And that that helps me to get through those moments of being alone and helps me to get past it and realize, you know what, I'm involved in something that is much bigger than me. It's very worthwhile. It's important. And so for now, I can deal with a little bit of aloneness because it's not forever. Speaking of alone, and before we came on the air tonight, Paul and I were joking with Les that there's two things he absolutely doesn't get enough credit for. Number one, and I have to agree with Joe Rogan on this, but dude, you invented the selfie stick. Like you were out in the forest walking around with a camera on a tripod making a selfie stick long before that was ever a thing. And number two, uh, just real survival TV. Can you talk a little bit about the origination of Survivor Man, how it came to be, and some of your influences? Of course, Paul and I are huge Art Bell fans, and I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, so my love for the outdoors and nature uh, comes a little bit from Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins. Uh, but what were some of your influences? Well, I definitely watched Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom uh, religiously. Um, Tarzan movies were a very big influence for me, um, and Jacques Cousteau. Uh, in many ways, I said, you know, what is Survivor Man if not a hybrid between Jacques Cousteau and Tarzan? And and that's because that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be somewhere in between there. Um, there's a fella up in Canada called Bill Mason, who's a filmmaker who makes uh, used to make films about canoeing, who also influenced me greatly. He's the only other filmmaker I've ever filmed himself, and he didn't have to survive while he was doing it. But um, I, I I saw a lot of techniques things through his work. His name's Bill Mason, great filmmaker, and I encourage anybody to watch uh, his film Water Walker if you want to feel close to nature. Um, and then, um, so, so yeah, and I, you know, I grew up with uh, all of the, the nature documentary type of work that I could get my hands on, I would, I, I would watch. But I think, yeah, Jacques Cousteau, Tarzan, Mutual Homes, Omaha's Wild Kingdom, all of that played into my filmmaking, which is why I consider myself a documentary filmmaker and not a reality TV producer. Well, Les, I guess what I find uh, most fascinating is, is that, you know, of all the people I know, you probably spent the most time alone in the forest and in the deep woods, you know, surviving by yourself. And you had some experiences that really brought Survivor Man Bigfoot uh, to life. Um, could you talk a little bit about that journey to making Survivor Man Bigfoot and really when you kind of crossed over and brought the two together? Well, it was a funny thing, you know, when the big thing happened in Alaska, I didn't tell anybody about it. In fact, I, I purposely didn't tell anyone because I thought, well, I'm not going to say anything because if I bring that up and tell this moment on a Survivor Man show, then nobody's going to care about the Survivor Man part of it anymore. They're going to be like all hung up on big, but I just didn't say anything, even though it happened during the making of a Survivor Man show. So I'll just let it go. And then a couple of years later, I was on the Opie and Anthony show, uh, I think, in New York, and I'd never brought it up. And one of them asked me, he said, hey, man, you ever see Bigfoot out there? And I'm, you know, I'm a guy who speaks from the heart. I never, you know, I, I uh, try to always basically tell the truth. I say try because I'm human, but I tell the truth all the time. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to back down. He asked me, so I said, well, actually, 
And then I told him the story that, that happened in Alaska. Well, I didn't know that was going to almost set off set a firestorm among fans, like that people went crazy. And and so then I and then I had all these requests, and I thought, you know what? Now I'm thinking like a businessman because I'm thinking, okay, Survivor Man and Bigfoot, those are two pretty awesome brands. What if they're together in the same same show? So I had the businessman's hat was saying this could be very cool, and the 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 curiosity seeker and adventurer in me thought. And I want to get to the bottom of this anyway. This will give me a chance. I want to get to the bottom of this because, you know, I didn't do much research. I just, you know, it, it, I just, you know, knew a couple things here and there. But my curiosity was definitely, definitely peaked. And for whatever reason, it was the right place, right time. And I guess it's uh, interesting to Paul and I because, you know, we have a lot of people that come out and want to talk uh, about their encounter, but they don't want to really share it on the show and risk their credibility. And then here you are, this legendary documentary filmmaker. Um, with a lot to lose by talking about Bigfoot. Did it ever concern you what bringing Bigfoot and Survivor Man together would do to Survivor Man? No, because I've never cared. Um, I've always done what I wanted to do as a filmmaker, an artist, a creator, an adventurer. What I do, I do because I want to do them. I've never tried to, I've never made TV to satisfy a network uh, agenda or um, the mass appeal or the way things are going. Um, and, 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 you know, I mean, I've always been um, diplomatic about it, like on my Facebook or, or social media, when, you know, because, you know, people would jump on board and they'd be like, oh, why are you doing that Bigfoot crap? Your credibility has gone down. You, you should just stick to survival. And, you know, I, I have two words for them, and I can't use them on this interview um, because I do what I do. I don't care what their opinion is. I could care less. And the ratings were great. We had a fun time with the show. Um, so uh, I, I don't usually – I know I said earlier I put on the businessman's hat, and I thought this would be great, two awesome brands put together in one show. But frankly, I don't usually think in businessman terms. I'm always thinking in terms of what am I, what am I sharing with the world? What am I creating from my creativity? What adventure am I living out? Uh, what am I doing to help society, to, 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 to leave a legacy and to do things that matter? Th those are the questions I ask. And I could have been a much more successful like, TV executive producer – I'd done a whole bunch of other things. And so really the question you're asking goes even back to the beginning of when I was asked to cheat Survivor Man. I said, no, I'm not going to cheat it. You know, now I would have made a lot more money, and a lot of people came around after me and did make a lot. They're laughing all the way to the bank because they cheat the show. Uh, when I say cheat, I mean they stage it, set it up, fake it, all of that. So I didn't, I didn't back down then. And with the Bigfoot thing, I wasn't going to back down then either. It was my curiosity. If you don't like the show, don't watch it. I don't care. You know, because – I think the phenomenon is re incredibly fascinating, and and it has. I discovered so many nuances to it that I was and I was right in believing that you know there needs to be a, a real solid take on the phenomenon, not a Hollywood take on it. And uh, and I wanted to I wanted to be that a documentary filmmaker. Actually, look, I don't do reality. I hate reality television, and I hate when Survivor Man gets lumped in with that genre because it isn't. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and when I took on the Bigfoot phenomenon, I took it on as a documentary filmmaker, and I, I was never going to allow myself to be the poster boy for any of the encampments within that you know, phenomenon, um, but I also wasn't going to – that includes I wasn't going to cave in to the outside world talking to me. I, I don't care. You know, how did – Doing a, a show on Bigfoot affect your Survivor Man followers? Did they kind of fall into that, or or do you think that people that were interested in that were really separate from your from your normal Survivor Man fans? I think there was definitely separation of fans, but also crossover, and the crossover region is, is bigger than the two separate areas. There's a few people that only watch Bigfoot, and, and a few people that will only watch the Survivor Man, but the crossover was good and strong. Um, and, it, and like I said, in the beginning, there was a couple of, you know, naysayers and, and uh, quite ignorant, you know, trolls, basically, you know, the, the, using troll-type language. Uh, and those guys I could care less about. But you know what? There's probably only four of them. So the rest, everybody, it was great. The short answer is, you know, uh, it, I, I've been doing what I do for years as authentically uh, as, as I think hopefully anyone could do something. And, and this has been what's been great about my audience. Um, uh, especially with, uh, I have some, you know, there's big news coming up soon, but, uh, what I'll be launching. Um, and I'm happy to, to be doing new work because I know people follow my work because of the integrity and the authenticity. I have to honor that all the time. 
I authentically um, have a real curiosity and interest for the, I call it the phenomenon of Bigfoot. I could care less what um, someone who likes my stuff thinks. The same thing with my music. I'm very passionate about my music. I have two new albums coming out. Flash plays on a song. Steve Vai plays on a song. Music is powerful. And, and I still have people going, why are you doing that stupid music? You should just be doing Survivor Man. It's like, wow, crawl back into your cave because you know what? This is what I do. And, and uh, you know, I play music. I'm interested in Bigfoot. I, you know, I, 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 I like good wine. And I make Survivor Man. You know, so, so uh, you can hear me reacting passionately to your question because, you know, if we were sitting here alone having beers, I, I would say I could give a crap what other people think. I'm I trying to make great art for people who are interested in it. And if they don't like it, then they can, you know, go watch something else. Wes, it's well documented that you had a couple of experiences prior to the beginning of Survivor Man Bigfoot. Can you share a little bit about those experiences? Yeah, in fact, I can go back in time a bit because looking back, um, once I got into the whole phenomenon, of Sasquatch and Bigfoot, I, 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 I learned a lot. And in doing so, all of a sudden, you know, if you do have a life, you know, of experiences out in the wilderness, you look back and it makes you think about certain times and moments when you went, huh, well, hang on a second. Maybe that wasn't, you know, maybe that, maybe that was something different. So I, I remember my very, very first experience was hearing um, the, the screaming and the screams out in the middle of nowhere. We were out doing practice and survival, a buddy and I, and, uh, uh, you know, building a shelter. And I heard these intense group of screams, and it sounded like women being tortured in some crazy ritual. It was scary. It's the only thing that's ever sent me out of the bush. I, I got up and I left. I went over and got my buddy. He was on the other side of a hill. He didn't hear it. And I said, well, I'm not staying. Let's go. That was, that was number one. Number two, uh, I, I lived out in the bush for a year with um, my, my then wife, and we had a situation where we were sleeping out, and we heard something very distinctly and clearly bipedal, two steps, only two steps, and two feet walking, very heavy. And we were behind, we couldn't really see it where it was walking, and when it started to get close, I got nervous, and I called out. I said, hey, I'm over here, and it stopped, and it turned. And it walked away just as, as you know, as, as, just as it came. And then the third one happened during the making of Survivor Man, and that was the, the episode in Alaska. And, and that, as you say, it's kind of well documented. The story's out there, and I've talked about it. And that was having you know something very massive and big in a tree, acting like a great ape and grunting at me, and and then crashing off through the forest. And that, but I was in uh, you know Alaska. I wasn't in ape territory. I wasn't in the Congo. So these things. Um, I did have experiences before I started to make the series uh, uh, Survivor Man Bigfoot, um, but it was actually through making the series Survivor Man Bigfoot that I was actually to sort of backwards apply some um, some in, some information and some intelligence to it. So, Les, as you were getting ready for Survivor Man Bigfoot, certainly you had to put some additional research into the topic. Can you talk a little bit about that journey? And certainly I know you met with uh, some purported experts on the subject, but as you got into the subculture and kind of went through the scale of believability, can you talk a little bit about the different camps you ran into and what you learned along the way? Well, it was a, a hell of a journey for me. Um, you know, when I started, I started sort of, you know, wide-eyed and open-minded and, and uh, um, also uh, skeptical, very actually. And when I started meeting all the different people from Jeff Meldrum to Todd Standing to John Bindernago, Dave Politis, um, you know, various uh, native aboriginal communities and on and on it goes. And then I realized like, wow, this is a massive group of really interested people who are really interested in this subject matter. They're really uh, intent on it. They're very passionate about it, some of them to the point of being obsessive. And they're all freaking arguing. They don't – not nobody supports each other. It's backstabbing the war. They all argue. They're all afraid of each other's opinion. They're afraid of what other people find. And so, it, you know, I went down a very specific road at the beginning and um, of, of, of looking – for of, of saying, okay, what is this about this? you know, bipedal ape in North America. And what I found was, a, uh, you know, I ended up going down a rabbit hole, a very slippery rabbit hole of, of, of whew, 
such a wide scale of possibilities that to sit in one encampment, never my style anyway, um, that's very useful to be focused, but it's not very scientific actually in the in the in the way of you know science is, is meant to be open, skeptical uh, with controlled skepticism and controlled testing, but open to the possibilities. And I found that it was a very closed world. There was, you know, and it still is. There's still a lot of um, snickering and, and talkity talk behind backs. And so, so as I said earlier, I decided very early and very quickly, well, I, okay, hang on a second. All right, there's more going on here than meets the eye. And now I'm, let's say I'm at about the third or fourth episode that I've produced that I'm, you know, talking to different people and I've been up on the mountain with Todd Stanning and I've been out in the bush with some aboriginals and I've gone down to Texas. And, okay, so let's say I've been filming that stuff. But along the way, I started thinking, you know, there's a lot more to this than I ever realized there was. So now what I need to do is keep my skeptical hat on, but oh, but it's, a, it's that weird combination of being very skeptical and very open-minded all at the same time. That is the dance that I dance, and I think that's that's the way of of discovering um, a lot of a lot of possibilities. Um, and so, on the uh, you keep, you're calling it scale of believability. Um, what I what I find is it it comes down to attributes, uh, and I can elaborate on that in a bit. But anyway, I, it, it comes down to attributes and the acceptance of certain attributes that this species may or may not have. Well, do you, Les, do you want to talk about some of those attributes? I know you said you'd talk about them later. Maybe this is a great time to, to talk about those. <laughs> not letting me get away with that one, eh? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, what? You, let, first, let's talk about the various forms of what people think. So people think uh, it's a, deep, all right, the first question is, what is it? So. I'm I'm talking to you, and you know what I know. I, I I don't think I have to get into the uh, does it exist thing with you. So so let's let's just do that for the sake of argument, right? Let's say for the sake of argument, it exists. Okay, fine. Because all these people that I was interviewing, they they they're not. It's not about if for them at all. So never mind the math, the outside world, and if it exists. Let's just say for sake of argument, argument it exists. So the next question is, well, what is it then? And that's where you get the encampments. You get um, uh, people who are absolutely certain it's got to be an ape um, uh, hominid, um, a, 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 what it called, a relic, um, you know the word I'm looking for. Relic, yeah, relic, relic hominid. hominid. Um, and um, Gigantithecus, uh, various scientific names for upright walking apes, or is it human-ish? Is it what kind of level is it, or is it, a, is it a human? Is it an offshoot of being human? Um, well, we share DNA, and so, um, then, and then, is it um, a spiritual entity? Uh, is it connected? Is it an alien itself, or is it a, a, an Earth entity connected to aliens? And you've got all, you've got everything sort of in between, right? Um, and so, what I was looking at all of that and thinking. Whew, that's a lot to bite off. Wow. Um, so I started, really, I mean, I started at the Gigantithecus uh, um, side and, and said, okay, well, hang on. You know, if it's an upright walking ape, you know, let's take a look at the attributes. And, and, and then and I was, you know, led to conclusions like, you know, look, it, could it exist out? Like, I'm, I'm, as I talk to you, I'm looking at a valley in Oregon, treed mountainous valley in Oregon. So is it out there? Well, realistically, technically speaking, on a biological level, could it? Could that happen? Could a, a very intelligent, upright walking ape, let's say on the Binder Nagel side of things, like it's an extremely intelligent ape, could it exist out there well hidden? For the longest time, my answer was yes, it could. I've flown over enough places to say, yeah, you know, it could. Somewhere along the line, I started to change my opinion on that, to be honest with you. I've never stated this opinion publicly, but. Somewhere along the line, I feel like, you know what, if it was only a smart ape, we would have one in a zoo. We really would if it was only a smart ape. Well, what's it, what am I talking about only? Well, that's where I get into all the other attributes, and that's where I, I feel that, that to really get to, 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 to get one or to, to prove its existence or whatever, 
is to open up your mind because if, I think if you stay on the level that it's only, I'm saying that strongly now, only an upright walking ape that's kind of smart and knows how to hide well, um, you know, there, that really only answers about 20% of the questions. 20% of what questions? Well, the question of the evidence. What evidence? Well, the thousands of ev pieces of evidence about rock throwing, vocalization, cloaking sort of kind of ability, infrasound kind of ability, footprints, tracking, track footprints, DNA samples, scat samples, hair samples, skin samples, blood samples, all DNA tested, um, sightings, of course. Um, and all of that evidence, all of those anecdotal references, when you pull them together, to me, create a picture of, a, of, of, of uh, attributes for this species that I'm having a hard time reconciling with it only being an ape. And that's where I went. That's, when that moment happened to me, I went, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, well then, well then what is it? <laughs> and that's where I am still now, and I've made certain certain thoughts on what I think it is. I'm not going to share them with you in this because I'm still working on that. But I'm going to say that in my pursuit, um, I will admit, and I've admitted this before, it's not so much about if. It's about what. What is it exactly? And of all these attributes, um, we can get into a lot of deep attributes. Um, which, you know, how many of these, which ones of these make sense? And let's remember that most of them or many of them have a thousand you know, human anecdotal references. We're not talking about two people said this. We're talking about, you know, hundreds to thousands of, of, of pieces of evidence. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, the uh, for the folks that have not seen Survivor Man Bigfoot, the production style with that skeptic's eye is really, I think, what just nailed that show home. Uh, I think you just you, you hit the nail on the head there. What are some of the more fascinating things that you saw or experienced along your way researching the subject possibly added to the fact that it exists. Now, I know you were kind of past that, but just to kind of mm -hmm. pad the nest a little bit more, what were some of the interesting things that you experienced or saw that really flummoxed you? Well, on the, on the, on the well, I can sort of almost brush off, but on the technical level, you know, you know, I, I, I as, far, as far as I can tell, um, the, the DNA samples that have come in and gone out and been proven, you know, to me, those are like, and Tell me again why why the general media doesn't think this is pretty amazing because it, it just blows me away. It's like, okay, so we have DNA, and it's been blind studied by university laboratories, and they're saying it's, I don't know, 95 human, 5%. Like, come on. Like, am I the only one looking at that going, holy crap? Uh, so that one always, you know, on a personal level, I, I, you know, it's like, okay, all right, well, this is, we're going somewhere here. On the, um, on the other side of things, um, you know, and I can get back into my past again on different experiences. I myself have a, a weird phenomenon that's happened around me. Probably about you know, 15 times I've been in a scenario where I'm, either I'm there for the Spider-Man Bigfoot or I'm not there at all for the Man Bigfoot, but I'm supposedly in a thick area, and the air is still. There's not a breath of air. There's no wind. There's nothing. And a tree comes down. And I don't mean... Lightly. I mean, in, in the case of it on my show, it happened on my show when I was in, up in um, in Canada. Um, it was thrown. It didn't fall. It, it was tossed. So when you have these, and then and then you know, let's add to that that I've read or I've heard on many many occasions that that this this is something people experience a lot that they do it to scare you, uh, that sort of thing. I think back and I think, wait a minute, what are the odds that me, as much as I'm out there all the time have like almost say around 15 times had a massive tree come down on a very still day with no wind. Now it could have just rotted. It could be just a temperature change in the molecules as evening's falling and maybe that makes the rot and it just happens to be, but it, it freaks me out. And and it definitely, uh, I'm always paying attention to that because it, I don't know, it seems to happen to me. But again, it doesn't happen to me, you know, uh, in my backyard, uh, you know, on my backyard tree, I'm talking what happens to me when I'm out there. The other experience that I find really fascinating is running into decorated tree stumps. And uh, not just one, but multiple deep off trail 
and uh, intricately decorated. And I believe you had some experiences in Canada and Southern Oregon. Can you talk about those experiences? Yeah, that was up outside of Vancouver, Canada, and um, I have run into it. Uh, oh, that's right, and also in Oregon. Um, I've run into that a number of times. And the thing is, when you see things, well, let, me, let me back a little this way. For those listening who are into the phenomenon and frustrated, they're just beginning of it, the, the, the tr there's, a, there's like a tipping point of understanding here. And I, it's, the word is subtlety. When you start to understand that there is a real subtlety to evidence, let's say, or, or potential, you know, things in the forest, then your eyes open up. Now, the problem with subtlety is, A, you almost have a hard time proving it to yourself. Like, oh, don't be an idiot. That, that must be from a squirrel. Or that must be – so so subtlety is just it's tricky enough in your own mind. B, you can't tell subtlety to anybody. Like, no, you have to understand, these rocks weren't like that. They've been moved, but they've only been moved uh, three inches, each one, this way, turned like that. I mean, no bear is going to do And so you start telling that kind of stuff, and people just are rolling their eyes thinking, you, you know, you, 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 you're, 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 you've been eating too many mushrooms. So subtlety <laughs> is, a, is a very tricky thing, and I pay attention to it out in the – in fact, I encourage people who are into the phenomenon, start paying attention to the subtle nature of, of the of, – uh, subtlety of nature and what's going on out there. And that's when you start, and, this, and then you get to the, like the old children's game, one of these things is not like the other. And that's when you start noticing, like, why is that like that anyway? And, you know, I used to do it with the stick, stick structures when I was with Todd Stanley. It's like I could CSI this and say, in fact, no, this one looks like it's just a bunch of trees that fell in on themselves over time thanks to wind and snow and rain. You know, and you can do that, but sometimes you get to something and you go, I can't explain that, man. This Stump um, covering um, is, is, is it's unique, and to me, it represented the subtlety of something. I'm looking, I'm thinking, okay, wait a minute. I'm in the middle of nowhere. No one ever comes out here. These are not just branches that have fallen and stuck. You could see these things are like almost like arranged, or, or, or it's, it's, you know. And I, I don't know. I made that up. I mean, in, in my mind, I, I was like, you know, surmising, thinking, well, geez, boy, if these things are supposed to be, you know so connected to the natural world and nature, maybe, maybe, and maybe they have empathy, and uh, I, I would assume they would have to, actually, and maybe their empathy causes them to, to, to moan the loss of nature, uh, and, 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 you know, so I, I sort of, that's where I came up with that thought, like, well, are they, are they mourning uh, these, these big trees that have been cut down? Do they, do they connect with nature on a level, you know, much deeper than we've ever been able to understand, uh, potentially, uh, and, and that's where I came up with that. So getting back to the scale of believability, and for those out there listening, we've tried to depict it best we can on SasquatchSyndicate.com, but when you get out to our main landing page, on the left, you'll see the flesh and blood camp. In the middle, you're going to get to more of the supernatural abilities and attributes that we talked about tonight, and then on the far right, you're going to get into the outer edge, and there is a camp that actually believes that it's possible Sasquatch is an alien species. And last you and I had talked about this, but I had recently done a panel discussion down in Santa Clara at Alien Con. And at the end of that panel discussion, a lady had mentioned your experience with lights up on the top of Radium Springs. Can you talk about that experience? Sure. And, and, I'll, and I'll preface it by saying I've never seen aliens or lights in the sky or any UFOs or anything like that my entire life. I know nothing of it, never seen anything uh, like all things in life. I'm open to it. Uh, to me, it makes sense, but I don't. You know, I still got to get up in the morning. I still got to make a paycheck, and I still got to feed the cat. So, so it doesn't. It doesn't. It's never. You know, it doesn't. I'm not obsessed about it. it doesn't change anything. I just think, eh, whatever. Well, that night, um, uh, th uh, of course, I've read that there's a lot of association with orbs and lights and that sort of stuff when it comes to to Sasquatch. Okay, that's fine. You know, I've read that. I understand that. There are people who study this, and, and okay, cool. I get it. Um, but that night on the mountain. Um, whether they're connected or not, I don't know. But um, I saw, and this is going to lead to another story here, but I saw these four lights in the sky, and they were massive. They were very far away, but they were massive. And, and I watched them sort of not move for about 20 minutes. And then I walked away. And here's, here's, this is what I want to get to the other story. The an interesting part is, I'm a cameraman. I'm a, I'm a professional filmmaker, and, and I'm a good one. <laughs> and I never even thought to film it. 
and I maybe because it was dark, it was night, and I thought well, it was not going to show up as much of anything. But but I never even I don't think it even occurred to me to film it. And and I walked away and. I, 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 by checking in the area, it's not a flight path. I mean, there's no way it was a big airplane. It would have been, you know, huge. Um, and then it just disappeared. And then that was the night that I, you know, definitely some freaky stuff happened. The apples and chocolate bars disappeared from the tree. We got the little nudge on the, uh, the camera that was filming the tree and feeling I had a, you know, when I was sleeping, all that sort of stuff. That happened that night. So there was, on the busiest sort of, night of activity, uh, quote-unquote, that I've had in the Sasquatch situation, I also saw some weird lights in the sky. But that's all I can say. I just saw some weird lights in the sky. Uh, while we're on the topic of Radium Springs, and I know that a lot of people listening to the show have seen your two specials that you did on Survivor Man. Um, one was Nordegg and one was Radium Springs leading up to the Survivor Man Bigfoot series. Um, but let's talk a little bit about Radium Springs. And um, a lot of people that probably don't have the perspective on how far you guys went in uh, to get to the ledge. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, that's a, uh, that's a long trek in. I mean, you're basically, you, you're out on dirt roads for a ways, uh, a few hours, uh, I mean, not a few hours, because I can't remember, but, uh, um, out on dirt roads and, uh, and then, uh, you keep going, you get onto a little forest road that leads to a trail. Uh, we took, uh, all terrain vehicles to get across the creek. Then it's climb up the side of a mountain, uh, to that ledge. Um, could, could, you know, if you were in Radiant Springs, could you get to it in one day? Yes, you could. Um, basically, that, but that's what it, that's what's involved. Um, so it's you know it's, it's you know it's right out there in the fact that Radiant Springs and that part of Canada is beautiful and rugged and mountainous and and uh, I, I hesitate to use the word remote anywhere ever anymore because you can <laughs> there's a dirt road everywhere you know in North America so I I, I don't use remote too often uh, but. Uh, for all intents and purposes, yes, it was definitely a remote spot. Not a, people, not a place where the public ever goes. In terms of production time, how much goes into each of these specials? And if you could talk a little bit about, from start to finish, kind of what that production schedule looks like. Uh, I would suggest uh, each episode's about um, a week or two weeks, two weeks in the field, um, a week or two pre-production, and then uh, usually about uh, nine weeks, ten weeks, eleven weeks of editing, all told. Um, and so, so, uh, you know, you're, you're two months, two months plus the editing kind of thing for, per episode. Yeah. I think it was fascinating as, um, you're producing that you didn't leave, you know, as I'm watching other shows on Bigfoot, um, they don't find things. You didn't find Bigfoot on your show. Your show was compelling though. Uh, your show was thoughtful. Um, I would leave each episode uh, with a sense of wonderment to where the other scripted, crafted shows, I got just what I got. The show was over, and I, I wasn't left with that with that uh, thoughtfulness afterwards. But um, any thoughts on doing something new around Survivor Man Bigfoot? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, if, if, uh, if anybody, if there's an angel investor out there, I'm, I'm not, what I'd like to actually do uh, myself is produce the once and for all definitive feature length feature film documentary release on the subject matter that's what i'd like to do right now i was very close with an investor at one point um but um uh, unfortunately uh, they he had a, a change of business situation he wasn't able to continue with me so i'm not able to do it at the moment i could go on pledge campaign well not pledge campaign. i could do a kickstarter campaign or something like that i'm very well connected with you know and i and, and i think that in spite of you know my my uh, desire to be very open-minded and even tease certain aspects of this phenomenon, I still believe I have the respect of people like Jeff Meldrum and certainly David Slytus, and they're friends of mine. So I have a lot of great people in a lot of great places. And, and I, I, who am I to do this? I don't know. I'm just me. But I think I could nail a very strong feature-length documentary film right now. That's what I'd like to do. Rather than fiddling around with a television series where I'm held, held into 43 minutes, I still – you know, and I'll, and I'll go back to what you said earlier. I'd love to actually. Um, uh, the thing, let me go back to it. The thing about doing the series is there's a delivery schedule. You squeeze everything in in 43 minutes. You, can only, you can't say everything you want to say. Nonetheless, I remain true to point on my series, and I believe it is thoughtful because I never promised to find Bigfoot. Um, this was about exploring the phenomenon, and that's why you know sometimes the people who 
are are obsessed with Bigfoot are more interesting than Bigfoot them, uh, itself. Um, so that's the way I wanted to keep the series. I will say this. So I'm going to be a little dramatic for you. I hope, oh, this is probably going to get retweeted, but um, I will say that you know I, I've never met individuals that that do finding Bigfoot, um, except for Cliff Barrickman. And I met him, and true to form, as everybody told me, he was a really nice guy. I really enjoyed talking with him, really enjoyed meeting him. I did hear, and I do know that he's very genuine in his passion for the subject matter. Absolutely. So what I'm about to say next is not on Cliff's head um, or, you know, uh, you know the, or the individuals who, you know, they did what they did. But the bottom line, in my opinion, that show and the way the producers produced that show and the way it was presented – did more to destroy real good interest in this phenomenon than any single thing out there. Because, why? Why am I being so harsh? Being so harsh? Because it was scripted, fake, set up, and in the end, it made Bigfoot become a cultural punchline. Bigfoot is a cultural punchline. They make fun of it outside of people who are into it. It's, it's a punchline in, in trailers for movies. And that, is, that angers me. Because I first got into it, you know, before Finding Bigfoot, before producing Survive Man Bigfoot, my thoughts were like, this is really freaking cool, man. If this thing exists, this is phenomenal, and it's so, just so awesome, and wow, and oh, cool, you know, we can study this scientifically, all this stuff, you know. And then along comes Finding Bigfoot, which was before my show, and it, be, it was a scripted joke. And I was uh, – and I think you asked earlier about the driving force for making Survive Man Bigfoot, a little slice of that was me saying, yeah, that series did not do this phenomenon of service whatsoever. Um, it made the name popular, but it made it a joke. And I'd rather bring some respect back. I think that's what I wanted to do with my series, bring respect back, back to the phenomenon or the, the study of the phenomenon, whatever angle your, your angle is. And that's what I'd like to do with a documentary film. Uh, if, if, <laughs> if you want to connect me up, I'm, I'm looking for the budget because that's the next film that I want to make. Well, we think that'd be an awesome film, and we'd certainly be first in line to go see it. Uh, speaking of TV shows, and we could probably do a podcast just about that topic, but you know, when I think of shows um, like Survivor Man Bigfoot and Monster Quest and Monsters and Mysteries in America, and even shows like Finding Bigfoot, I think that the great thing is they're sharing information about the topic, and it's connecting people to this phenomenon. Well, and I think that when, when I saw you guys at the, at the summit in Washington there, and then I, I was on stage... You know, after that, I, I, I wanted to point out, you know, when people are focused on a particular directive of this, let's say, you know, like Dr. Jeff Meldrum, it actually is wonderful because they are very focused. And so the amount of information is, is really trivial. Whether they're open-minded to other possibilities, it doesn't matter. They, they get a lot of information. That was one of the thing, key things I pointed out, like the Olympic project. Um, you know, what they're doing, they're gathering data. And if you want to present a court case, he with the biggest binder of data wins. And so you want to have and, – and, and unfortunately, we've all been lay people doing this, and nobody's been doing it with, with, and gathering data. You know, I respect so much of uh, a lot of what Todd Standing did, but my biggest bitch on him was, dude, why are you not writing this down? You say you found 38 structures. Did you measure them? Did you count how many sticks are in each one? Did you figure out what type of wood? Because you know what? If you did, you might have a, a database of information that is compelling and consistent, and that's the stuff that wins arguments. And so, you know, yeah, all of these people and everything that they're into, that, that's, that's one of the things. I don't care whether you think it's an alien or a Gigantopithecus. Data collection will, will be the thing that wins the argument in the day. So, Les, going back to your legacy, you mentioned that earlier. You know, you're this uh, amazing documentary filmmaker, an activist, uh, an author and an incredible musician, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But can you share a little bit how you want to be remembered, not only on the subject of Bigfoot and your approach uh, on this topic, but just in general? Dude, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Says uh, Survivor Man, whose every breath is a cliffhanger. Yeah, it's just interesting to use the word legacy. I mean, definitely, um, I have thought in terms of legacy uh, before, I, I, unless it starts to make me feel like I'm finished. This is an interesting time for you to ask me that question because, you know, I, I watched a while, a long time ago, uh, the U2 documentary, the band U2, and, I, and some quote there, Bono talks about, you know, I, I forget exactly, but it was something about, you know, you're, you're doing one big thing, and then, you know, you're, you're, you're going to do another big thing in between, 
there's nothing. And that's a little bit what I feel like right now. I am, I'm in between right now. I have spent 15, 16 years being Survivor Man and doing Beyond Survival and Bigfoot and Shark Week. Um, and, and, and I have so much more yet that I want to do. Um, the legacy for me, I guess, in my heart of hearts would be to know that people look back on this stuff and say, this is some killer documentary work. I mean, look at the, look at the body of work. I, I, I often envy artists that do a lot of work, like Frank Zappa and all the albums he's done. Or recently we were talking about Tim Burton, and I was like, holy crap, look at the list of films this guy has done. And I forget that I've done over 71-hour films. Because I treat every single show as if it's a film. I've never thought I was making a TV show. And so I forget to pat myself on the back a little bit and go, dude, you know, you've done a lot of work. There's a big body of work here. I've got five albums. I've got over 70 shows and, and all my live appearances and all that. So what's next? And you know what? You're asking me this question at a pretty kind of emotional time because I'm like, I got I to gotta do the next big thing. And uh, I'm still young and vibrant and strong, and I plan on staying that way. And I'm 55, but I'll put most 30-year-olds to shame, and I stand by that. And, and because I want to stay. In my mind, I never left 29. So my legacy is not over yet. And I think that, um, for example, doing a, 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 an, an intelligent, definitive Bigfoot documentary right now for, for a, a feature film release, not unlike – Blackfish or the Cove or Sharkwater, but that sort of intent and power, I think that could be a piece of my legacy. And then the other thing is, okay, so now I'm going to shut up and stop being so verbose, and I would say this. You know, a big <laughs> part of my legacy has always been about one thing, connecting people to nature, whether it's Survivor Man or Bigfoot or my music. Everything is always about getting people back out into nature. And if we get them back out into nature – they will love nature. They love nature because they know it because they're getting out in it. They will protect it. I'm not saying we don't need logging or mining. I live in a house. I drive a car. I'm saying we need to love nature. And that is, I hope, you know, when I look back and read Sigurd Olson or John Muir or people like that, I hope maybe one day, you know, someone will look back and say, look at the body of this guy's work. You know, it's, on, it's, it's up there with Jacques Cousteau. It's, it's that type of, this guy was passionate about nature and everything he did, whether sensational like Bigfoot or intriguing and interesting like Survivor Man or compelling like his music, it was always to make us feel connected to nature. That's what I want, I think. Yeah, you know, when I when I think of Les Stroud, um, a phrase comes to my mind. Uh, it's just you're kind of the one-man gang. I mean, you are a writer, producer, composer. You do so many things. If there's one guy that is going to make the definitive movie on Bigfoot, it's going to be you. And it's going to be a classic, classy, classy piece. Oh, thank you very kindly. I mean, I do have a great team. There is a great group of people. Barry Farrell's been my editing partner for years. In fact, when he first saw season one of Survivor Man, he said, I see what this guy's trying to do, but his editors suck. And he tried to work for me on a couple of occasions, and I thought he was too good for me, so I never said yes. One day I had to fire an editor, and I said, well, let's try this Barry guy. And we've been together ever since, and he's dying for me to do the Bigfoot film. He's, a, he's really a brilliant editor. So I do have a, um, a solid team out there that, 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 I, that I very much enjoy, that's for sure. Speaking of enjoyment, and uh, for those out there that aren't aware, Les is a fantastic musician, and he's very passionate about his work. Les, you had done some uh, sessions called Barn Sessions, mm -hmm. and um, they're some of our favorites. And I thought maybe... Uh, one of the songs that was really relevant for tonight's show uh, was Far Away Gone. Would you happen to be uh, able to talk a little bit about the lyrics of that song and really what it means to you? Absolutely. And then just to touch on the music, I've been writing since I was 14, and I used to write for record labels when I was 21. And then I got out of that to get into adventure. And then I became adventure guy for the longest time, and then eventually I became Survivor Man. Then I got back into the music uh, somewhere along the way, and I've been doing it ever since. And so performing for me, writing for me has been a lifelong thing. Um, I do have two new albums coming out, as I mentioned earlier, and, and um, being produced by Mike Klink, who he did all of the Guns N' Roses albums, Metallica. And it's a very passionate pursuit for me. But now, now I'm focusing all of my lyrics and all of my work on celebrating nature. Before this... Um, I certainly still write love songs and, and hurting songs and different things like that. 
Um, one of the things I wanted to do was a session called the Barn Sessions, and I'm still doing it. Every two years, I get a great group of musicians together. We sit in one room. We, re- we, we record my song, top to bottom. You get three or four chances at it. Move on. Do the next song. If you didn't play it right, tough. We're still going to put it out as it is. So it's really a great challenge and test for the, and a testament to the musicians in the room. Um, and so Barn Sessions, um, that's what they are. I've got uh, Barn Sessions 4 is coming out in about a month with all new songs and some killer covers I did on there. Um, Barn Sessions 3 uh, features the song Far Away Gone. Uh, I remember, and it's funny because I actually wanted to change the lyrics on the first line. When I sing it live now, I say 4,000 4, memories pouring down like rain, 4,000 teardrops drizzling down my window pane. And I always thought that was a great you know, visual way of, of connecting my emotion with the emotion of, of 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 the the earth itself, my emotion with the emotion of of nature. Nature's raining, and so am I. Um, that song, it is a bit of a of a lament about being alone, about um, about losing someone, um, and and it's about it's about recognizing that the loss is about to occur, really, more than anyway, more than anything. Um, and for a while, when I would write lyrics like Far Away Gone, I, I would think, you know, I don't want to bum people out. And it was only recently I heard something that changed everything, changed that completely for me. And that's why I'm glad you're, you've got far, far Away Gone there. And it's this. When people, when Leonard Cohen died, someone said, you know, Leonard Cohen made you feel better. And I thought, how did Leonard Cohen make you feel better? His lyrics are dark as anything. And they, they continued and said, because when you heard his lyrics, you realize you're not alone. Someone else out there feels the same way you do. And so now when I look at my song Dark Side or Far Away Gone, which you have, that's the way I think. I think, you know what, this is, these lyrics are about lamenting the potential loss of, of, some, of somebody. And I've been through that myself. And anybody who hears the lyrics will know they're not alone. So from the entire team at Sasquatch Syndicate, we wish you a safe and happy holiday season. And I know Les wanted to share some final thoughts with the troops. Just once again, I would like to, again, thank the troops. Um, I can tell you a quick story that that there was once upon a time I was uh, approached by the troops in Afghanistan. and They had um, television piped over, and and they only asked for two shows. This is a while back now. It was The Sopranos and Survivor Man. And so they contacted me because I, they, have to, they have to get it free. And I said, absolutely. So I very much support uh, the troops. Um, and I know that there are so many troops that are Survivor Man fans. They approach me all the time in airports. And I, I love meeting them and very proud of the work they do. And, and I am, again, very much hoping that uh, they're able to have some enjoyable Christmas holiday. Absolutely. We couldn't agree more. One final request. Paul S. and I are trying to get this episode out to as many military men and women and their families as possible this holiday. If you're on social media, if you could please share this episode, we'd really appreciate it. And finally, for those that enjoyed this holiday special, if you could please write a review on your podcast network, we'd really appreciate it. And for those that do, please message the show on Facebook. We have a special gift for you this season. So Les, thanks again for coming on Sasquatch Syndicate. We really do appreciate it, and I know our listeners do as well. All right. Thank you so much, sir. I'll talk to you guys again. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This concludes our 2016 holiday special. Sasquatch Syndicate will return on Sunday, January 1st for New Year's. Thanks to all our listeners and those that have been out to our website and those following us on social media. Sasquatch is a controversial subject. So for all the believers and disbelievers and those that will tell you they have all the answers, just remember, we're flying through space at 700 miles per hour. Buckle up.